Welcome back, Washed Up Walk-Ons fans, to episode 133 of the podcast, a.k.a. the We're Still Not Canceled podcast, a.k.a. the Y'all Thought We Were Talking Out of Our Ass podcast, but also the a.k.a. Turns Out We Knew What We Were Talking About podcast. And uh, I really think that's just where I'm going to get us started at, Kluver. Uh, narrate us right through this one, bud. Yeah, well, what do you think about that? Like... I, so, there's a lot to talk about, friends and family of the Wash Up Walk Ons. Hashtag Walk On Army, by the way. Seen it a couple times. Walk On Army. I like that. I like that a lot. It's a thing. It's a thing. Um, so, family, we've got a lot to discuss. First of all, on the docket, August 3rd is, is nearing, and one of the topics I want to touch on is the best basketball player in the nation, Luca Garza, has an insane decision to make in the next three days by Monday. Now, granted, there's some stipulations to that decision that uh, I believe there's some there's some loopholes there. There was a 10-day notice post that. I, I don't know. There's some other stuff, but we'll discuss that in a second um, because, you know, we'd like to have that guy on our team. Uh, right, Kevin? Right? I, I mean, if he comes back, it could be – a it could be a decent year for if Hawkeye basketball. Back, if he comes back, we're going to the Final Four. Well, we're going to the Final Four, and we might win the whole goddamn thing. On accident. Uh, or purpose. Uh, so we're going to get to there. But, but Drake said, um, the AKA we knew what we were talking about the whole time podcast. And addressing this, I, the Hush, Hush, Hush Blackwell report, on the Iowa football situation uh, was released today on uh, July 30th, Thursday. And uh, accompanying, accompanying that was a, uh, I almost said a podcast, a KF podcast would be insane. Uh, a a po- Jesus Christ, I just said it again. A fucking uh, press, conference. press conference done by Barta and KF, the man, the myth, the legend, the captain, Kirk's dogs walk on army. Um, and so there's a lot to discuss. Uh, mainly KF was asked a specific question about uh, a former teammate of ours, Akram Wadley. We, uh, we did almost a whole podcast on him. Uh, mostly me. I talked about him and Robert T green, Bobby green, uh, all that situation. Um, and a lot of people were, were happy about the one statement and I'm going to play it here. Um, make sure that you guys can hear this as well. But this is uh, this is Kirk Ferentz's full response to being asked about Akram Wadley um, and what he had to – and Kirk's thoughts on what Akram's claims were. Surprise. Uh, now, I don't want to comment on an individual that I comment on, a couple who I spoke with and uh, did not identify who I spoke with on June 6th. Um, but it was a surprise and also – to some degree, uh, surprise because some of the things. Oh, see there now. Let's 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 digest that a little bit. <laughs> to some degree, what? To so some degree. Ooh, to he some was. Degree, to some degree, I wanted to punch him in the face. Is that yeah. what you wanted to say? Absolutely, absolutely. He was gonna get. He was gonna get a little edgy there, and then he pulled it back and just said surprise again. Um, coming from three guys who know exactly i mean we've sat in how many meetings with coach kirk ferentz i mean we we know exactly the pulse of of that man how he's feeling what his thoughts are if he has more to say uh if he if he feels like he got out what he wanted to say and and i let me tell you it's not hard to for those of you who've never sat in a meeting it's not hard for you guys to tell that uh coach ferentz was holding back severely because he is a legendary man who has legendary constraint much more than we on this podcast have Kevin your thoughts uh I was just about to say his constraint level is you know 50,000 times that of what we had this man literally just sat back and took it for two months Mm -hmm. and he has his chance he's got the mic and he says I was surprised I was surprised Imagine the grit that that takes. Oh, it, I was surprised when this man has been fanning you out to the dogs for the last oh. two months. KF, and, you know, the report always, comes back. He's like, eh, it's kind of bullshit. And 
you have your chance and to like literally just put the dagger in him. But you know what? He's a better man than I am. He's a better man than all three of us. And he's not a mortal. He, he's not a mere mortal. He's a man with mythical powers. So, so he says, I, I was surprised. And, and, then he, and then he says he was surprised again. So, so we'll continue. This was just flat out not true. Oh, not true. oh. Be, uh, surprised because some of the things were just flat out not true. Oh, and there it is. Oh, and there it is. Now, this is where I was getting at the top of the podcast. A lot of you have said that I so, – so now we go back to when I had the Akram ap- episode, and, and I was calling out that I knew some shit wasn't true, as Coach Ferentz just stated himself. And I, I don't want to come off wrong here, but I would <laughs> – like I have no dog in the, I mean, I do have a dog in this fight. I'm Kirk's dog, but Kirk's dogs. we're Kirk's dogs. We so are the dogs in the fight. Call us biased, but I'm no longer attached to this university. You know, if the, if the, if the football program at Iowa was torn to the ground, it would truly in a legitimate way, in any way that would truly affect me, financially or reputation wise, it would do nothing to me. It would do much more to other people. I would be a non-factor part of that. Now, would I be sad? Would I be pissed off about that? Yeah. That part of my identity? Yes. But you know, I would be okay. Um, so I, 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 and for that matter, Drake and Kevin have no reason, you know, back on those episodes with when we talked about the situation or when we initially came out with our thoughts, there's zero reason for us to lie about anything or try and push a narrative about anything. Our whole goal during this entire process has been the truth. All right. We admitted, so, you know, we admit, I admitted more about Doyle after self-reflection and kind of our time there than I would have ever thought I would have admitted about Doyle. And my thoughts have shifted a little bit. I just want the truth. Right. And so I've gotten a bunch of comments today on, on that video saying, oh, you called it, Tyler. You called it. The Akram thing was, was false. It's like, I didn't call anything. I didn't call anything. I'm not guessing. I know. Everything I say is what I know. All right? I'm not the Astros 2020. I'm the Astros 2017. I know what's coming. Okay? All right. All right. How long did it take for you to come up with that line? I'll be honest. I said it to Drake before the podcast, and he said, if you don't use that, then you're a pussy. (laughs) But it it makes it no less true. I am the Astros 2017. I got the buzzer under my shirt, meaning I've played. I saw what Akram and all them – I know what's true with what's being said and what's not. Most of it. Um, And and so we'll keep going here. but I can tell you this, KF wanted to absolutely explode. He got a little piece, right? He gets to say that some of it wasn't true. And that's as far as he'll ever go. I, it, it made, I watched it live and it made me fully aroused to watch him be able to, 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 to watch him be able to say that. Because I know that this man has been hurt. And now he goes on, it, it gets even better. Not true. never happened. Um, it was stated, I think, that I said derogatory things in a press conference about an individual. Uh, those are a matter of record. And it's, you know, some of you may have looked those up. You know, stand behind what I said. Oh, oh, he gives the shoulder shrug. Dude, I'm, I'm watching the video as this happens. He goes, to show, he, goes, he goes, you know, that's a matter of record. Huh? That's a matter of record, okay? He's telling, he's telling in the nicest way possible. I'm sorry. A lot of you, I've gotten a few comments lately about the, the cussing on this, and I'm going to really try and tone it down. I know I'm going to try and be a professional from now on, but this is KF saying in the most professional way possible, check the tape. Check the tape, motherfucker. I haven't said anything. Carry on. Those press conferences, and as recently as uh, May 26, um, his mom and I were having, you know, good conversations. So I had no sense it was that bad, quite frankly. Wait for it. Yeah. Oh, 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 he says, oh, he says, oh, he says, well, hold on one more. I got to get one more punch in. 
Oh, I love this. He goes, I'll go back. Now, I'll go back to two. Uh, during the course of the, when we got back from uh, California, conversations with his mom about trying to get him placed in the XFL. Work that probably his agent should have been doing, but trying to help and I uh, knew some people in the XFL. So I think he went to Atlanta as a result of that, that conversation. So I- oh, he says, he says, he says, by the way, you know, said it was a nightmare playing for Iowa football. Well, congrats that I gave you that shot in the XFL, huh? Congrats. I'm pretty hey, sure he we went. Got, we got to press pause on this real quick. Jake wants to say something to the fans. Oh, my God. You guys God. got new Wi-Fi. Oh, my God. Thank you for new Wi-Fi. Jake Gervas, up, Jake Gervas upgraded his Wi-Fi. On Iowa. Go, go Hawks. On Iowa, go Hawks. He's had enough of being harassed on Twitter about it. It worked, boys. It worked. <laughs> hey, that's, that's on, on you guys, Walk on Army. That's walk on, on you guys. Army. Anyway, back to this. He goes, he goes, uh, he says, back after we got back from California, we were in talks. I was helping him out. I had some contacts in the XFL. Probably some work his agent should have been doing. Ooh, like that, KF. I like that a lot. <laughs> And then he says, I'm pretty sure he went to Atlanta uh, as, a, as a result of that. So basically like, hey. Nothing like KF letting the world know that he was literally the reason that this kid got a job. Man, so anyone watching or listening, you can tell I'm happy. And I'm, I'm not happy that this is a, is a thing that has happened to the program. Uh, I am not happy that a lot of former teammates of mine felt like they were not treated fairly. Um, and, and, and a lot of those claims are uh, relevant and um, have tru- truth to them. I am happy that KF has finally gotten to take his shot back at some of the bullshit that, that has gone on in this. So, man, uh, that, you know, that was KF's comments on, on the Akram stuff. And I know for a fact if you let that man talk a little bit, you asked situation by situation about some of the, uh, some of the stuff that was said by individual guys that, that he would have some thoughts on it. Um, but I mean, it just goes back to what we said the first podcast we did. You know, Take what you see on Twitter with a grain of salt. Acknowledge that there was a, a problem, but you know, what you see on Twitter is not reality. Yeah, it's... It, <sighs> it almost comes back to the Twitter rule of like you got some guys in their feelings too far in the feelings. Those, those Drake knows about it. Those Twitter fingers come out. Right. And there's, there ain't no, there is no, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, there's not a lot of structure when the Twitter fingers come out. Right. It's, it's just emotion filled tweeting. One of the things yep. that KF was trying to, and the staff were trying to kind of prevent because oftentimes, especially when you're playing division one football, uh, emotions get charged after a big game or after, you know, we've, you know, maybe a tough loss. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you say you put someone in body bags when you're on a high, <laughs> maybe you come I will, out. I will say though, maybe, after... maybe you're so depressed after a loss, you come out and say, you wish you were in a body bag. It, it, it goes or you go ways. respond to like one of the trolls and your mentions like it's it's yeah like i gotta say i commend the guys so far two months in nobody's said anything dumb mm-hmm. well, i mean keith duncan's got some dumb tweets out there but stupid tweets that. he's not dumb he they are dumb tweets but the the uh similar to the way that i kind of run my twitter the intent is not dumb he he's not stupid he's gaining a he's gaining a following um and and causing faux drama by tweeting dumb stuff by tweeting dumb shit that you know it's smart of him building a brand um but you're right it's two months in and and he goes on to say he is asked about in that in the press conference today he's uh he goes on to say that with the twitter thing um i I don't remember the specific question because it wasn't just about releasing the ban it was about something else related to twitter he said, moving forward, it, they, they're going to take an educational approach to the Twitter thing. So I, obviously that's smart, right? If you're going to allow something that you haven't allowed before, there needs to be some sort of sit down, um, you know, kind of the problem with this whole thing is like, what are the expectations? What is exactly expected of you in this certain situation when it comes to Twitter? 
They need to know exactly what's expected of them and exactly what will put them on the wrong side of things and what those punishments or uh, consequences will be. Um, and I think, I think they'll be fine. I think in this world, again, kids know how to use social media better than 2010 when Twitter was three years old and um, we didn't really have, fully. I have a lot of confidence that uh, yeah. these guys are going to use social media in a more constructive manner than Robert T. Green and Akron. Yeah, probably, probably a little bit more productive. Uh, yeah, so – Low bar there, but good job. Yeah. Yeah, low bar. Um, so, so that was what we wanted to kind of start off with is like I, I didn't call anything. I, I appreciate you guys giving me the props of calling it, but that's like – it's like I had, a, I had chicken for lunch th- today. Like and I watching kinda, a movie, it's like watching a movie you've seen before and predicting the ending. Right. It's exactly right. Um, that happened to me one time in a UFC bet with my uncle. He had a UFC fight taped and I was like, Oh man, I'll bet you anything. This guy wins. He's like, all right, how much you want to bet? And, uh, I was wrong. If your uncle actually collected the money from you, that's hilarious. And he's a scumbag at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that no, is that's scummy. A bet, man. That is scummy. Uh, yeah, man. So, so. So that's the happenings of today. We're going to get into the, the report, the Hush Blackwell report. I have it pulled up. Now it is 28 pages long, and that is the most reading I've done in a while, boys, in a while. Um, I usually read like 15, max 20 pages a day if I'm reading a book, 28. It's getting a little lengthy, but uh, it's important stuff. Um, before we get to that, though, let's talk a little bit about the energy. This, let's go off topic. Let's fire it up a little bit here the energy that we brought into this podcast, we've got, we're moving. The wash of walk-ons are making some, what you call moves. And listen to me, folks, listen to me, folks. I'm talking, I'm talking to both ladies and gentlemen here, ladies. I'm talking to you. If you have a husband or a man and men, I'm talking to you. If uh, you have a lady that, that you would like to spice things up with and, uh, you know, make things a little bit better. We're about to have a new, sponsorship in this podcast and we need you guys to go off we need you guys to go off both in your personal lives and for us using our soon to be new promo code uh i won't say yet don't ruin it (laughs) don't ruin it for us (laughs) i'm just gonna say like from from someone who doesn't know what you're talking about it sounds pretty dirty yeah, sounds yeah. Like we're t- <laughs> so so sounds like you're but, about to say Adam and Eve is sponsoring a cop. Yes. And listen, I hope to get an Adam and Eve and Blue Chew sponsorship and maybe even Roman swipes at some point. That'd but be great. for now, Manscaped will have to do. Hey, no free ads, man. Yeah. So so Drake, yeah, you're, gonna have, you're, you're gonna have you're gonna have to you're gonna have to block that out. Might have to bleep it, but uh, but we're gonna we're gonna we're we're making some moves. We we did not reach out for this one. We. Uh, we were contacted and uh, we're very excited. It, it's putting us on the road to uh, some legit. I mean, you guys have heard the ads. I've, I've you know, like I said, uh, with, with Louie, um, our mortgage guy. In fact, I think Kevin might be. Have you started running those ads yet? Yeah, those ads. Yeah, they've gone for like three or oh, four. Oh, yeah, man. Lot, I've been working with Louie. Louie's the man. Louie's helping me get my, my first house. Yeah, there you go with Kevin. He's literally helping Kevin. And uh, Louis, our mortgage guy with Key Home Mortgage Group, um, or Key Mortgage Group, he is uh, he's a cool dude just like us, and he's he knows his shit, and we don't. So if you need Shout anything, out Louis Lens, Louis Lens, baby, uh, Louis Wicked at L Wicked at GoHomeSide.com, check him out. Um, we're making moves, and so that's one sponsorship. Another sponsorship from a big company, like a legit paid sponsorship, man. And we just need one domino to fall for this thing to kind of tumble. So, and listen, like three weeks ago, we were canceled on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, just remember that we went from the, we went from the coffin that people say the proverbial Twitter coffin, and we set up in that some bitch like the Undertaker, yeah, pulled our eyes back and said, mm, "Surprise!" Might have to insert his intro music. Um, so that's exciting. Also, assuming that you know, now that this report is done. You know, uh, you know, KF, hopefully, I, I really hope the coaches feel a little less stressed um, that now that this is over, this is out, we're moving on, right? Uh, KF's, or, or uh, Kevin 
said, tweeted a couple hours before we recorded this, Coach uh, KF is my head coach until they put me in the dirt. Now let's play some football. And that's exactly how I feel. Damn straight, motherfuckers. Um, Sorry about the language. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, we are hopefully going to get the, the final okay on the Kirk's Dogs shirts very, very soon. We are also hopefully going to get word on the Hawks by a Million flags very, very soon. I am trying. Trust me, I've sent strongly worded emails to UI licensing asking why they okayed the uh the design for t-shirts and now that it's we're trying to get it approved for a flag it makes it any different um so hopefully those things happen and i i know we keep saying this like merch in a couple weeks but we keep just getting ghosted by these supposedly respectable organizations uh really just ui licensing um and so hopefully sometime in the, in the first couple weeks here of August, we can, we can have a merch update. That's like, Hey, we're going live with merch. Um, the Kirk's dogs shirts are simple, but so sweet. And, uh, who knows? Maybe we'll sneak the walk on army in there. Who knows? Um, we might have I mean, to have would... walk on army special shirts only for the Patreon. Yeah. Right? We, we might have true army veterans. You're right. You're right. Um, so we'll, we'll see on that. Now let's, Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about give Cliver. I just want to give you a quick shout out, man. Cause me and Drake don't do anything behind the scenes and it's all you. So I know we give you shit, but none of this happens without you. So yeah, quick shout out to Kluver. And that's why I'll be taking hundred percent of the profits. Um, <laughs> burn this motherfucker to the ground for us. Uh, unfortunately, I think when we signed the, signed the uh, LLC papers, it was like 34, 33, 33. So tough one for me, booze. Um, but I did give you that one extra percent because I we, and we did give you the one extra percent. Yes. There was a lot of foreshadowing into the fact that you were going to do way more than us. So yeah, I probably I probably should have bargained for like 40, 30, 30 on this, but we would have um, given it to you. But guess what? It's 34, 33, 30. I tried to, I tried to be a nice guy. Let's go back to this report now. Um, so I, I, the guys have read the report. The wash up walk ons have done the reading. And this is, this is something that is, uh, you know, maybe interesting. Um, so let's go over this. We're not going to read the whole report. We're going to give our thoughts on some of the, some of the more highlighted issues. Now, the first thing to me here is basically if you haven't Explain read this report to him, Kluver. explain it in detail, what the report actually means for well, people who just skimmed it or just got info off Twitter. Sure. Sure. And I'll just read their kind of synopsis of what this is and then kind of give you the layman's walk-on version. Report of external review. The University of Iowa retained Hush Blackwell to conduct an external review of alleged racial inequities within the football program, including mistreatment of black student athletes and a racially charged climate. We recognize that this matter has generated widespread attention and strong emotions have been expressed about the football program on various media platforms. I'll take that as a shout out to Washo Barkins. Probably not. Uh, our task was to set this aside and impartially examine the football program's culture and perceptions of current and former players with respect to these matters. This report provides a summary of the information gathered during that review. Okay, so here's where it gets interesting, and I feel like it actually – it just kind of becomes boring, right? So it says a few other things. Um, some of the specific allegations and incidents we describe were corroborated by numerous witnesses. Other specific allegations and incidents, however, were disputed and or uncorroborated. We were not asked to determine the veracity of any specific allegation or incident. Therefore, our reciting of a given allegation or incident is in this report is not a determination that the allegation or incident occurred as reported. So what does that mean? That means that basically we hired, not we, proverb, we, we, we hired, they hired a law firm to just be an unbiased third party and just publish in a professional way everything that was already said without finding any evidence that it was true or not true. I was literally thinking about leading off the podcast by 
just talking about how the university could have saved themselves a ton of money right if they just would have paid us a couple dollars <laughs> to do the exact same thing dude uh, <laughs> kf like barda we're right here well, we'll do we the did a month ago we put it out in video version of the same shit that this law firm just did hey guys pay us a couple dollars house and blackwell you got half your information from our podcast <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, in simple terms, we basically got a third party, not anybody associated with the university on the would be side of the coaches or the, the staff, not anybody on the side of the players or anyone coming out and speaking there, just some random third party unbiased to basically gather all the info and publish it professionally. That's it. So, you know, it talks, it talks about all the stuff. They interviewed 111 people, including 45 current, 29 former uh, members, Kevin being one of those members. Hello. Um, you know, they give background information. They, they, there's a you know, 42% of the people interviewed were white, 52% were black, 6% were something else. I guess they interviewed Miguel, uh, Miguel and <laughs> Miguel and AJ Epinesa. <laughs> I don't know. That was it. Um, yeah. So th those are kind of the breakdown. Um, and so they go into a bunch of things and I just, uh, my feeling was that this report and you guys can give your thoughts. My feeling was that report was in no way negative. I think, I think what we were looking for is a lot of people were like, Ooh, it's going to get juicy. People were looking for the smoking gun or the reporters say this is all bullshit. One or the right, other, pretty much. Right. And, and it stuck right in the middle at, hey, we're just repeating the information. You know? They do give their thoughts. And let me scroll down to their thoughts. Um, conclusion. And we're going to talk about some of the stuff in between here in a second. The current and former players who participated in this review described a range of personal experiences, both good and bad, within the Iowa football program. Many are passionate about the program and have had a positive and rewarded, rewarding experience. Virtually all the players spoke positively about their position coaches and the influence those coaches had on their lives, both personally and athletically. Yet, numerous players described feeling unhappy and unwelcome, citing to a program culture that they perceive requires strict conformity and rigid adherence to the mold of an ideal player. A mold that many black players felt they could never truly fit because it was built around the stereotype of a clean-cut, white athlete from a Midwestern background. Additionally, numerous current and former players and coaches of all races described an environment in which a, num a small number of coaches felt empowered to bully and demean athletes, especially black athletes. In some, the program's rules perpetuated racial or cultural biases and diminished the value of the cultural diversity. The program over-monitored players. I have, a, I have a little issue with that one. Uh, to the point that they experienced heightened anxiety and maintained a culture that allowed a small group of coaches to demean players. We have separately provided personnel reports. Um, it says players are cautiously optimistic that the coaching staff is listening to their concerns and have genuine conversations with them around difficult and complicated issues. Finally, both the athletic director and head coach fans expressed their commitment to rebuild trust with players and foster an environment that embodies the department's values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, they basically said they came away and, you know, in conjunction with the uh, press conference, there's no other personnel changes. No staff has been fired. Brian Ferentz is not canceled. Seth Wallace is not canceled. Uh, and anybody else is not canceled. KF is not canceled. So for everybody looking for the world to continue burning and they wanted a little extra gasoline on the fire, you're not getting it. All right. Sorry. Cause guess what? It kind of, th this report. You want to read the, you want to read the part with the, they uh, pull out the survey statistics. Yeah, I do. That was, that was, that was the survey favorite. statistics were fantastic. And uh, while you find those one particular statistic that I found particularly false was the fact that black players thought that they were uh, drug tested more often. I can tell you that I for sure was drug tested somewhere between 20 and 25 times 
throughout like, rightfully so throughout the first four years of my career i didn't get drug tested one single time in after i broke my leg not once shout out it's probably uh, when they should have started that's, yeah. when they, that's <laughs> really when they should have started that's when the trt <laughs> would have come into play but uh i, I did actually learn this oh go ahead that's all I was going to say is that that's not a, that's not a real statistic. I did actually learn something interesting. One thing that I already knew is that, you know, they test people more often if they test positive once. Right. Or if they have a diluted sample. Correct. And I have which, some, I have some things which to is, talk about. Now I understand why I was tested so many times senior year. Cause your boy was fucking pounding water back in 2017. <laughs> all right. So I, I have some, I have some things to say about the, the drug testing as well. <laughs> which we never touched on in the original, you know, with this, that claim had been out there, but we never touched on it. I'm going to read some statistics real quick. I want you to keep in mind while reading these statistics that um, when you went to, if you go to another university, you would not find across the, the board on these numbers, you would not find a place that was a hundred percent on probably any of these numbers. And so incredible scores, good scores, great scores, percentages on these numbers are in the nineties, even in the eighties, because, uh, when you have, like we said, I think I did the math. There's been like almost a thousand players to come through in the last 20 years of KF. You got to imagine that maybe 10 of them, you know, maybe even 50 of them, probably they don't feel like their career worked out the way it should have, you know? So 2018, 2019, this is the summary data from student athletes about their experiences in the program. Again, majority black. Strength and conditioning staff received no ratings of poor or below average. Head coach, over 90% responded yes to whether they would become comfortable or they would be comfortable approaching the coach with a personal or team concern. Position event Assistant coaches, 90.32% responded yes to whether they would be comfortable approaching the coach with a personal or team concern. So uh, stu- uh, athletes approaching assistant coaches, position coaches. Four players, four, said they had been subject to bullying or hazing by a member of the coaching staff. 95.7% responded that they had not. Find me another place that doesn't have four kids that thought that they were a little bullied. I mean, it seems pretty, I don't know. I don't know. You, you, you make your assumption, right? 2019, 2020. So in the last year, strength and conditioning staff received no ratings of poor or below average head coach. Again, 90% responded yes to whether they would be comfortable approaching him. 92 up to 92% on assistant coaches, two players said that they had been subject to bullying or hazing. 98.04% had not. You tell me. This has only been out there for two months. You tell me in the last two years. Those are those from 2018, 2019. Those numbers don't, re, don't, they don't scream a bullying, demeaning culture to me. I don't know. I don't know. Um, let's go back. So, you guys have any thoughts on those? I mean, that's not my opinion. Themselves. That's not my the opinion. Numbers, those are numbers. The numbers speak for themselves is all I'm going to say. And those are from, those are from. Anonymous eight, service. Yeah. A, yeah. So, um, again, I, you know what? I would take a, all, all of those numbers were right around 90%. Some of them. You know, we had a 92 and a 98 or 94 and a 98. I'd take those, those percentages on a test all day, all day, mostly because I never got better than what you're going to get cheating off Drake. That's for sure. Uh, Pretty sure. Yeah. You cheat off me, you get an 84 in a trash can. You cheat (laughs) on this test or you, whatever you you take this test and you get a 92 on your own. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, back, I mean, yeah. Like, back to the drug testing thing. I want to go into a little bit of, I don't know, player experience with that. So when we were brought into the program, and this, this could get dicey too, uh, but I, I don't want to make it dicey. I don't want to make assumptions, but um, 
let's, you know, I'll say, I'll say this. When you're brought into the program, you meet Chris Landit. I think she's still the person doing the drug test, probably. She's the, she's the lady you see at 4.35 in the morning sitting at the table in the complex. Oh, you're on the, you're on the piss list. Start drinking because you got to pee. She comes in and meets with the freshmen. And you are told this. Everyone right now has a clean slate. If, if after this single meeting and this single chance that I'm about to give you, you test, that is when, that is when you start, right? Um, but in that meeting, every freshman that's brought in, every new player that's brought into the program is giving, given a get out of jail free card. If you did, if you snorted Coke before you walked into that meeting, or if you, you know, were smoking weed the night before, or if, uh, you know, if Blake Trulick was fucking doing, you know, TRT and Clen before that, everyone got one chance to, to kind of anonymously text Chris, the drug lady, the, Say, drug, hey. the drug test lady, not the drug yeah. lady. <laughs> and say, hey, I'm pretty sure I'm not clean. The procedure was then to get a, a free test that no one found out about except for her or whoever tested. And then from that point forward, you get to, you get to move on clean slate. So you get, you get one freebie. I had a feeling. I got a feeling. Large amount of people decided to, to opt in on that freebie. Right? And... I, I just think guys who tested positive once got tested more often. Guys who were a 138-pound kicker who've been tested three times and never tested positive probably wasn't testing too often after that. I got tested 25 times, so take it what you Did want. Did you actually count? I, I think it was 24. I'm, I'm very confident in saying 24, but, you know, what's 24 to 20 to 25, you know? Yeah, so I, I I don't know about the uh, I don't know about the drug testing. Any other spots in this thing that you guys thought were interesting? I, for me, there was one spot. Um, they did they did talk about the uh, they talk about the shakes. They talked about body weight. Let me body weight was a big topic. Yeah, the the, the people who interviewed me were very curious about the body weights. Yeah. Um, let's find that drug testing concerns. How long was your interview, Kev? Uh, it was probably a half hour to 40 minutes or so. And, you know, they, they just pretty much went down the line of what you see in the report and ask you a, a lot about them. Like some of the topics I wasn't asked about, like they didn't ask me a lot about dress code, but, you know, like body weights, um, the Iowa way, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. What your interactions were with the coaches, your relationships with the coaches. Had you ever seen, like, people being bullied or disparaging yeah. remarks, stuff like that. And, you know, it was, it was a pretty thorough interview. Um, yeah. I just gave so, my accounting of my time. Yeah. So here's the making weight section. Numerous players discussed the pressure they felt to maintain the requisite weight. Sure. I mean, yeah, you're expected to be at the weight that they expect you at. Right. Right. Uh, two players, one current, one former, reported that coaches subjected them to unfair and unreasonable weight expectations after being sick, leaving the current player concerned he would be kicked out of the program. The current player said that a white player who was sick and lost weight was treated more favorably. Okay. Um, in my I, time, I, is there was, any way to argue that objectively? I mean, I, I, that's all it is, is, is it's all subjective. Yeah. I mean, that's all it is. I mean, in my like, time, I mean, if you get, if you get mono and like you're out for two weeks, you know, when you come back to weigh and they're not going to expect you to be on body weight. Yeah. They never did. I mean, it's just, they were always pretty cautious, especially Unless, with you know, like guys who like, had surgery or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. One former player said he was so anxious about making weight that he involuntarily threw up every morning before weigh-in. Guessing this is Akram. I'm guessing it was because you had the intakes. Now, so why? So, so I guess you know the whole root of the problem, which they don't really, they don't really talk about, is 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 a weight expectation realistic? 
And God, you, anybody can come fight me on this one. But yeah, yeah, weight expectation is realistic. Now, is the window, they talk about the window of, of, of yeah, air. five pounds, man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really not, it, it was not a hard thing to do. Um, if you want to play Big Ten football, or any, any football for that matter. Any sport, man. Like, you got to have like, weight on you. It was for safety. The reason Coach Doyle wanted Akram to put on weight is so that if a 240-pound linebacker came through the hole and blasted his ass, Akram wasn't left dead on the field uh, because Akram weighed 180. 180. I mean, like, it's just sport in general. You, any sport, you're going to have your ideal playing weight where you, you're going to get the best performance. Right. So, so being anxious, he was so anxious about making weight. Well, that anxiety comes from the worry that you're not going to make it. So w w you got to read into a little bit and figure out like, okay, well, this guy's right. not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Well, I'm just going to say this, like the coaches frowned upon chugging to make weight because yeah. that's bullshit weight. That's not real weight. No, you have a, a week to make body weight. So if you're 180 and you had to be, you know, 180 again next week, well, make sure you eat throughout the week and you, you'll be okay. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the former player who had trouble gaining weight after being sick said, you know, I'm, a, I'm still assuming this is Akram, but the former player who had trouble gaining weight after being sick said a coach told him, you don't care, you are lazy. Checks out. All I'm going to say is that there is a, an endless amount of calories to put in your body at that, yeah. at that, at that building. So. Mm -hmm. uh, a current player identified that, is, that it is difficult to maintain his body weight over breaks. Uh, because he does not have the same access to food when he's at home for extended now, now periods. Now, that one I'm actually sympathetic for. I hadn't yeah. thought of that before. Yeah, I, I agree. But when we come back from breaks, you get a little extra cushion sometimes. Uh, at least they did when, you know, you don't get 15 pounds of cushion, Terrence. You don't get 15. Especially not the wrong way. <laughs> but, you know, you might get five or you might get an extra couple days to get back there. So, So there's that. One of the coaches confirmed – that the strength conditioning staff was strict on body weight and that players had anxiety about body weight. Yeah. I mean, it, in my mind, this is just one of those things that's like, Hey, you're big boy. Now we got some, we got some, some things to do. And, and this is one of those things that's pretty proven. Uh, I had anxiety about my body weight. So did I, everyone did. And it, it was a, it was a, a necessary anxiety. It, not even anxiety. It was more of just a concern. It was like, this is part of my life. This is part of what I, this is part of my job. In my mind, it just forced you to do things correctly. Right. Um, and it's for your, it's for your good. Every, it's, I, it's for your own good. Everything that we did had a purpose behind it. Um, you know, from dress code, uh, body weight, uh, you know, how you conducted yourself. And I think that we could have done a better job of explaining why we did the things. Why it was important, yeah. Other than just saying this is important. Right. Um, the sleep band stuff was interesting to me. Yeah, that was, so that, was that started after we, uh, yeah. after we had left. So they started wearing sleep, sleep bands. Now, again, for me, man, this is just – this one seems pretty straightforward, pretty undiscriminatory. Like, hey – if you want, I've, I've told my story on the podcast. I slept five hours a night my freshman year and I did not meet my way, my lifting goals that freshman year in the easiest year to make insane gains in lifting and strength and conditioning was the least amount of gains I made over any year because I did not sleep sleep. I mean, we could go into it. Us three all know, but sleep is just insanely important. So expecting good sleep or at least expecting to track sleep and kind of monitor that doesn't seem like a stretch for me. Um, many, many players described having to wear sleep bands, which they said was a very negative experience and caused lots of anxiety. I mean, this goes back to like your parents just telling you to go to bed. Hey guy, if you get your sleep, if you just put the phone down and go to bed, then there's no anxiety. Like, yeah, uh, I, yeah, there, 
I get what you're saying. At the same time, though, like, <laughs> I think that we may have taken just a little too far with how much we were getting to each you guys' private lives. Just a, just a little bit there. I'm with like, Kevin here. I didn't like the sleep bands. I thought back when they were getting described to me by players, I was like, wow, that's horse shit. Like, I would be- <laughs> I would be absolutely furious because I was furious about the heart rate straps. I right. The, the, we, so we did the athlete. So we, we had to measure our heart rate variation as soon as we woke up. And uh, well, it was just annoying. But are you furious about repercussion or are no, you furious I, just no, about the, the monitor? Annoying and it's like, dude, like give me a little bit of privacy. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, just a little bit like but, at, I, but of at course the same sleep's time. important it's like one of the most important parts of being an athlete is getting good quality sleep of just living life yeah right i think you know you should just be able to emphasize that to your athletes and you know not have to big brother them so okay i we did we we don't disagree but i, I guess we're on a little, slightly different sides because i think Man, to gain an edge on your opponents, like if your whole team's sleeping eight hours, I'll take the team. Oh, yeah, sleep. of course. It, it, uh, there's no doubt that a team that sleeps better is going to have an advantage over a team that doesn't. I'm just saying, this is just one area where I'm just like, ah, uh, it's a little, this a little much for me. And they did say that this, that, that from now on, this, it's going to be more private, the results of that, and there will, there, it won't result in any punishment. It's just an educational positive thing that they're trying to implement because it is very important um yeah and then uh i guess i don't so so i want to finish on there's a lot more to the report but i want to finish on the iowa way um which is kind of if you go back and listen to the podcast we did originally is probably what hurt uh kevin and i the most Um, and I'll read a little bit about it. Every individual we interviewed was familiar with and described the concept of the Iowa way. As witnesses explained to us, the Iowa way is the phrase used to describe the philosophy instilled in players to guide their actions in all aspects of their participation in Iowa football. Head coach Ferentz explained that the way Iowa way is the football program's mode of operation. He has three goals for each player within the program earn a degree, maximize abilities as a football player, and have a fulfilling college experience. Head coach Ferentz, I don't like how they say that. Head coach Ferentz also explained that an educational program called the Iowa Way was initiated in 2019 for the incoming freshmen on the team. Six of the position coaches give talks to players about critical elements for success, including academic, athletic, and social success. Coach Doyle also referenced the new educational program, explaining it is used to teach the values and standards of what makes successful athletes. While no interview interviewee provided us with a formal definition of the Iowa way, current and former players provided the following descriptions of its meaning. These are player comments on the Iowa way, tough, smart, physical, disciplined, regimented, hardworking, their way or the highway, grind it out. No excuses. Do not speak up about things. Follow the rules and stay in line. Don't get in trouble. Do things the right way. Put the team before yourself and stay humble. No nonsense. Show up. Don't complain. Don't have an attitude. Be quiet and do what you're told. Fly under the radar. Don't be flashy. And then the last one is a way to conform and be normal. So there's about three negative ones in there. Uh, Their way, well, I guess that could be conceived as, or perceived as, conceived, perceived as negative. Their way or the highway. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's absolute facts. Um, is that a bad thing? No. Nope. I don't I don't think so. And I think this is where the perception comes in because as an 18-year-old kid, you come in you think you're going to do it your way, huh? You you know how to you know how to you, make it You joined our team. Yeah. Right? This is how we do things. Right. And and I I get that a lot of people don't like that. Uh, and it comes to this whole conformity thing, right? Conformity is the bad word here. And uh, I'll be the first. You no, know, I was talking. I was talking with Miguel, and he told, and he he had this, this 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 sentence that I just really loved. You give up a part of yourself for something greater. Mm-hmm. 
And actually, there's one like that. Put the team before yourself and stay humble. I liked all of them up until like the last three. Right. So the one said, do not speak up about things. And again, as I said in the initial podcast, after this all came out, we probably did have a, a too tightened down culture where it was so tight that anyone who wanted to speak uh, probably felt better to just kind of, to just not. And I agree that that's something that, that definitely should be worked on and sounds like it has been worked on. But at the same time, go back to the statistics, 90% plus said they felt comfortable going to the head coach or the position coach. Right. Right. You know, so it's, it's a little conflicting. Uh, Follow the rules, stay in line. Don't get in trouble. Seems pretty straightforward. Um, Be quiet and do what you are told. Be quiet and do what you are told. Well, um be quiet i sure Wait, mm, mm. i wasn't be, quiet that's for don't damn. be I don't know about be quiet like I don't, what, what do you mean by be quiet like don't speak up or i, don't I think it's, it's uh i think it kind of goes with the next one fly under the radar and don't be flashy don't make noise don't make noise um and then the last one is a way to conform and be normal a way to conform and be normal I, I come back to this part where, and maybe this is where a lot of it got messed up. A lot of the players, black or white, did not realize or still do not realize the amount of conformity, even in a good program, or not, that's, that's poor terms, in a healthy program that has everything going right, that, you know, where players feel like they can do a bunch, you're going you're gonna to have to conform, my guy. You're going to have to a little bit like, like Miguel said, you're giving up part of yourself because when, when, when it comes back to this, punch a guy with an open fist, punch, punch a guy with an open fist with five fingers that are trying to be themselves. It ain't going to, it ain't going to turn out well for you, but you put those together. Everybody comes together for the greater good. I don't punch people, but you know, people who do. The sum is greater than the individual parts. Yeah. So so is conformity a tough thing to deal with? Yes. But is some amount of conformity necessary? You ask Tyler Kluver, he says, yeah. Um, those are the players' comments. Down to the coaches, tough, smart, physical, discipline, accountability, structure, giving great effort, doing things that are hard, doing things the right way, showing up and doing your work the best that you can, doing little things right that create a competitive edge to help create success being responsible. I love, I love how I basically know who said each and every one of those. I know <laughs> <laughs> being responsible, accountable, caring, and caring more about others than yourself. Oh, if I could delve into that one for a little bit, but I won't. <laughs> um, I think it's about time that, you know, we put this thing to rest. Yeah. I mean, here's, here's my we thoughts. Say our, we say our piece and we bury it. Here's my thoughts on the entire thing. These are your last thoughts. This is the last time I want to talk about this. This is it. This is it right here. And it's mostly about the report and the findings. Again, it was just, it was just regurgitated. It, it, it softened all the tweets up, put them into a professional format. It seems to me with the percentages that these guys found, the description of the IOA from the players – Conformity was a little bit, not a little bit. Conformity was the issue. Players did not understand what they were getting into. Early on in a player's career, that type of conformity uh, and having to, frankly, you know, the conformity, because there was conformity from black and white players. Like, believe me, and I'm sure you guys would echo you guys conformed. I conformed. It's not like yeah, the black. We were not perfect as freshmen. Right. Any it's, it's not like the far from it. It's not like our, our black teammates were the only ones that are conforming here. It just was a much bigger stretch that they had to, that they had to kind of run than, than we did or some, or some of us did. And so I think that's where 
the information about why things are important and why rules are the way they are. The real issues of racial uh, stuff that really kind of even came up in the report were basically the stuff that black players uh, wanted t-shirts or the way they wore their clothes, their earrings, their hair. That was kind of the, what I would call insensitive, racially insensitive stuff that kind of, as time has gone on and we've grown as a a society, that's the stuff that um, Iowa football did not change or adapt well with and should have before this point. But addressing those, the hair stuff, the earrings, the music, all of that stuff, little things, easy fix, easy fix, easy fix. And then basically all that, all that was left, I mean, Doyle's gone. 90% of players are happy with the coaches. I, the only thing that's left is players feeling like they can be themselves. And it sounds like, and it was their finding as well, that most feel that that's where we're going. So it, it all seemed, quote me on it, blow me up. It seemed like, you know, and Twitter does this. Twitter's inevitably going to do it. It all seemed a little bit pour gas on the fire. Let's, let's have some fun. Anyone who wants to see Iowa football burn, let's see if we can burn it. And now after the report comes out, it's kind of like, okay, well, we've fixed a few things. We've, we've caught up to the time socially and, uh, and we've got plans in place and, and we're moving forward. It, it seems like it was maybe just a tad overblown, but those are just my thoughts. And I'm never saying anything about it again. That's it. That's it. It's your piece. It's done. That's it. Drake, you want to go? I don't really got much to say, man. When you're right, you're right. And uh, I just – I let people bury us for a long time, you know. We we were getting buried right along next to those coaches by, by the uh, vocal minority. And that's okay. I'm speaking to the vocal minority. To, to our army, I love you. To those of you that are on the edge of being in the army, but you're more just like uh, – Grab a rifle, baby. Just a back backup dancer. We would love for you to grab a rifle and, and go to war with us. Uh, We're calling up the militia, baby. I, I'll tell you what, man. I'm a long way from Iowa, but I love Iowa football. I love my coaches. I can't be more thankful for the man that, I, that they turned me into. You know, I was a little boy when I walked in there, and I would like to think that I grew up a lot because of those individuals. Uh, I go to war for my guys, and I just told you so. Truth prevails in the end. I can't tell you how happy I am to finally put this behind us. So, you know, we had a problem. Black players were leaving at a higher rate, a a, a bad rate than white players. We had a very strict and disciplined program that is a shock to adjust to. In addition to the shock of going to college and from the conversations I had, it's like, okay, yeah, it's probably going to be harder for a black student athlete to adjust than a white student athlete. And I think we talked about it in our first podcast. It's harder for them to adjust. And we were probably a little too hard in general on first year players. And once you get in that doghouse, it's a hard place to get out of. And, you know, a year and a half later, you, 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 you can't put up with it anymore and you feel like you're probably better off going somewhere else. Um, so I, I think there's a lot that we can learn from it, but at the end of the day, I, I don't believe that any of the coaches had it in their hearts to mistreat or to run black players out to, uh, you know, give opportunities to white players that black players didn't have. I, I just can't, I just, I just can't believe it from all the conversations that I had from, from all of I've read. I just, there's just nothing that can make me believe that. Cause all those coaches wanted to put the best football team on the field as possible and to make those boys at 18, like Drake said, into the best men that they could be at 22 so that when they left the program, they could go be, get a successful job 
be a good husband, be a good father. You know, I, KF just loves hearing stories about like how players went on and be wildly successful outside of football. And that's what he wanted for all of his players. And KF said in his press conference today, he's like, you know, not everyone's going to be happy with their experience, but everyone deserves a fair and a fair chance to succeed here. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a learning opportunity. I think, I think the Hawks are going to be better for it moving forward. And, you know, at the end of the day, we've, we've said it since, since June, and, you know, the report confirms it again, the guys in the locker room, they feel really good about where the program's at. They feel really good about their coaches and they feel real comfortable right now. So I, I I'm excited to see where Hawkeye football can go from here. I'm excited to put this, put this in the past. Um, and I, I think, uh, I think, I think we're all excited to see, see this one be put to bed, and, you know, go Hawks, man. Go Hawks. Kevin Ward, everybody, Kevin Ward. Now real quick, before we end this podcast on a lighter note, our three opinions right now, August, or August 3rd, Monday is coming. It's near. What does Luca Garza do? Is Luca Garza in a Hawkeye uniform? With the with the the balance of college basketball and college football as well to throw it all in there, Corona, COVID, doing everything it's done, will there be a season? Is Luca Garza an Iowa Hawkeye or is he off to the NBA in three days? What do you guys think? I think he's coming back, boys. He was he was coming back before Corona, and I think this is gonna make him leave. National champions, 2021, print the shirts, baby. He's coming back. <laughs> Let's go. Walk on Army, episode 133. Um, this will be the only episode. This is coming out on Monday. This is the only episode of the week. Uh, tech guys on vacation. Hope you guys enjoy the week. Go Hawks. Kirk's dogs. Hawks by a million. Advantage. Can't cancel us. Advantage Iowa. That's it. Peace. <laughs>